Just a few years ago, most of them were small, fringe groups far on the margins of European politics. Now, the parties of the hard right are projected to win the European vote in the largest countries on the continent. But will their support translate into real political power? And what does it say about us, the European society? Good evening. My name is Mateusz Mazzini, and this is Why The View. Much of the coverage ahead of next week's European Parliament elections has focused on the growing support for hard-right parties. On the one hand, they're now positioned to become the second largest force in Brussels, second only to the centre-right European People's Party. On the other hand, they form a diverse and often very incoherent ideological family with major differences on key policy terms. What's fueling their surging popularity? How likely are they to form a stable alliance in the next term in Brussels? And is their success inspired or simply fueled by foreign interference? We will examine these issues with our guests in a minute. But first, let's take a closer look at the state of the far right in Europe in 2024. Eurosceptic and ultra-conservative parties have always been a feature of the European political mainstream. But in recent years, we've seen them reach new levels of power. Various parties from the hard right are in government in as many as seven EU member states. And they're now leading the polls in several others, including France, Belgium and the Netherlands. Politicians like Marine Le Pen, Viktor Orban and Gert Wilders completely reject the idea of further European integration. They want to block arrivals of migrants, abandon climate-friendly regulations and protect what they define as traditional family values. But they face a lot of internal differences. Giorgia Maloney, Italy's Prime Minister and the leader of the Brothers of Italy, is among Ukraine's strongest supporters in Europe. Most hard-right parties share this view, but some don't. Hungary's Fidesz, Italy's League and Germany's AFD are openly calling for peace talks with Vladimir Putin. They say it was the West who provoked Moscow into invading Ukraine. And cozying up to Russia isn't the only controversial item on their agenda. Just a few weeks ago, a leading AFD politician named Maximilian Krach made revisionist statements about the SS. His remarks came shortly after one of his staffers was arrested on charges of espionage for China. Krach has publicly defended Putin and argued that Europeans will soon be replaced by Muslims. Other hard-right politicians question the consensus on climate change, pack courts with loyalists and attack independent media. Their views are winning increasing support among the electorate. The latest polls show that the hard right will most likely be the kingmaker in the next term in Brussels, a scenario that many in Europe dread. A very timely but also complex and delicate issue that we have to discuss tonight. And to unpack these complexities are with us three very esteemed experts on the topic. Dr. Julia Ebner from the Violent Extremist Lab at the University of Oxford. Susanna Weg, Program Officer at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. And Anshul Vora, Columnist at Foreign Policy Magazine. Good evening. And I want to immediately uh, start with you, uh, Susanna, and ask you to bring some definitional clarity to that discussion, because we have various terms being thrown around quite easily in the public debate. Hard right, far right, extremism. What are the basic differences between these groups? And if you could label individual European parties belonging to each of those uh, categories for us. So we actually begin with some uh, academic order, so to speak. Um, indeed, uh, thank you for having me. Um, so there is indeed quite a cacophony of, uh, of terminology when we are talking about these parties, although we typically know who we are talking about, but uh, we use many different terms. 
Um, I would say the term far right and hard right uh, can be used relatively interchangeably. And uh, I would approach these as the umbrella terms for um, a variety of actors, parties, movements, but also subcultural groups that harbor nativist or ultra-nationalist ideology that have uh, usually an authoritarian view of uh, society, meaning that uh, there should be a strict social order followed. And if there is deviance from that uh, order, that should be severely punished. Uh, now, within the broader umbrella of far right or hard right, I think um, the simplest way to differentiate key actors is uh, the difference between a radical right and extreme right. Extreme right actors would be those which uh, fundamentally uh, reject the idea of democracy at the very core level of democracy. Uh, namely, they reject the idea that people should be electing their representatives and leaders. Simply put, extremists believe that a leader should lead. Um, so an extremist right uh, actor today would be, for example, a neo-fascist, uh, a neo-Nazi uh, actor, mm -hmm. uh, if you think back to um, the Golden Dawn in Greece. Uh, now, the radical right um, does not fundamentally reject the idea of um, democracy. It uh, does endorse the idea of elections, but it does reject values and principles of liberal democracy, such as pluralism, inclusion, and also the um, protection of minority rights, not only ethnic mm -hmm. uh, minority, but even political minorities. And radical right uh, actors on the European scene are, for example, uh, Fidesz in Hungary, uh, Rassemblement National in France, so pretty much the well-established leading political parties under this um, party family that mm -hmm. uh, we've been, we are going we to We'll definitely go into the case study of Fidesz and Viktor Orban's policy in Hungary later on in the show, but I want to bring Yulia into that discussion because you've got a vast research experience in German-speaking uh, countries, and you've directly witnessed the, this uh, explosive growth of uh, AFD. And I wanted to ask you, because AFD has been on everybody's mind in European politics for quite some time now, uh, what are the roots of this explosion of popularity? And do you think that they are going to firmly establish themselves in the mainstream of German politics? So are they here to stay? It's a really good question. I mean, uh, one of the key drivers for IFD's popularity has been a whole set of grievances among uh, a wider population, where, of course, the overlapping crisis um, that well, we've seen on a global scale, but in particular also in Germany, uh, starting with, of course, the the, the so-called refugee and migration crisis, where Germany welcomed a lot more migrants than other neighboring countries did. Um, but then also uh, now, of course, the pandemic, uh, the COVID pandemic, the overlapping uh, economic and inflation crisis, and of course, also the ongoing conflict, especially the invasion, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, that has all caused a lot of uncertainties in the German population and probably on the European level overall. But AFD has been particularly good at hijacking the debates um, and sometimes tapping into some of the, the fears and uncertainties of the population. They also have the best, uh, unfortunately, I would say the, the best or most successful social media strategy. So they've been extremely good at tapping into youth cultures. Um, for example, via TikTok, there have just been studies that were published recently that showed how effective their communication has been on TikTok, which mirrors to some extent the successes that other far-right populist parties have had on social media when compared to more um, the centralist parties. But uh, yeah, I, I would say that it's a combination of, of different factors and it's quite complex. But the AFD has, of course, had conversations with uh, more extreme actors. So if we come back to the definitions um, of, of radical right and extreme right, there, has, there have been lots of uh, overlaps between AFDs um, 
memberships or AFD's politicians, but also with the networks of extreme right activists from movements such as the Identitarian Movement, which, for example, campaigns mm -hmm. for um, for remigration of all migrants or all people with migration backgrounds. And they hold on to this idea of the Great Replacement, which is a conspiracy myth um, that basically propagates the idea that the global elites are trying to erase or to replace white native populations with non-white uh, populations. Kind of following so, up I on what you said, Julia, I want to uh, bring Angel into that conversation and expand, it, expand this question into the wider European perspective. Because Julia mentioned a lot of grievances that the, the far-right electorate has, especially against elites. Do you think that this is the main uh, fuel for the support of far-right parties across Europe? I think there are many reasons that the far-right is rising and uh, uh, I, I do think that there are genuine concerns amongst people and they have questions that have not been answered. And I think primarily the mainstream parties um, have sort of failed in giving an explanation to a lot of people. And here I'm specifically talking about fence-sitters and not necessarily people who are sort of predisposed to uh, far right ideas, or you know, have a have or are against immigrants from a country where Islam is a dominant religion. But I'm talking about fence sitters. And when I go out in the field and I talk to people, whether it is in Germany, France, Belgium, or even the Netherlands, there are you know people have questions. And I think that the socialists and democrats in here in the EU and the socialist parties, uh, left leaning parties, more centrist parties, are not clarifying these doubts are not answering are not giving proper explanations their narrative is not as strong i think they're sort of banking on uh, um banking on just one strategy which is uh most of these far right hard right radical right parties are um are fascist like and that argument is being pushed forth. That I'm not saying that's a bad strategy, but I'm saying that is just one part of it, should be one part of it, and more concrete answers should be offered to people on the ground. For instance, in Eastern Germany, in states like Thuringia, where I am quite often uh, um, uh, talking to people. And I think if I, that would be a concrete step that the liberal left, liberal right, center left, center right can actually take to counter their narrative. And I, if you ask me, I think that is actually the main reason that they're rising, that their narrative is not being countered effectively. A very important argument, the inflation and abuse of the word fascism. I think something that we're going to tackle in the second part of our show. Let's pause that discussion for a second and move to the subsequent part in which we examine how dangerous the far-right and extremist movements in Europe actually are. The growing popularity of Eurosceptic groups benefits Russia and China in obvious ways. But are these politicians actively inspired by foreign agents, or are they simply carrying out someone else's agenda without realizing? In a number of cases, the far-right has been called red-handed, but often the links aren't that obvious. Let's examine the connection between far-right and Russia in this report. In March, Europe was rocked by yet another Russian propaganda scandal. Czech intelligence services dismantled The Voice of Europe, an online news platform run by Kremlin supporters in Prague. The website offered a mix of authentic news and fake reports, following the Russian misinformation playbook to the T. The platform often featured prominent far-right politicians from across Europe. Some of them, including the AFD's Maximilian Kra, have even been accused of receiving payments directly from Russian operatives. In the past, accusations of financial links with the Kremlin were made against Marine Le Pen and Matteo Salvini. But many of the hard-right parties echo Moscow's narratives, even if they don't have direct connections with Russia. They draw on anti-vaccine conspiracy theories, support climate denialism and question the very fundamentals of science and medicine. Traditional conservative principles are often absent from their agenda, replaced by anti-liberal and anti-democratic views. As these parties have grown in popularity, they've come to represent a significant portion of the electorate. Now they're attracting attention from bigger, more established right-wing parties. The British Conservatives, the Spanish People's Party, and Poland's Law and Justice have all shifted to the right in recent years. They're attempting to combat their emerging competition by taking over a share of their vote. This process has led to the overall radicalization of the entire European right, 
With a shrinking center and weakened institutions, extreme views are no longer seen as exotic or fringe. On the contrary, they've basically become part of the European political mainstream, and that's already a victory for the far right. And I want to begin the second part of our discussion with Yulia and ask you quite a short, frank question. How did that come about that groups that used to be fringe very far on the margins of European politics have firmly established themselves in uh, the political mainstream in Europe, both in terms of their own presence, but also their views partially hijacked by more established groups? Yeah, it's been quite alarming, to be honest. I've been in this field of research for the last uh, almost 10 years now. And when I first started researching extremism and radicalization, I really was in the darkest corners of the internet. And I was researching fringe groups of maybe a hundred or a few hundred uh, members or a few thousand members. But now I've seen some of these ideas, uh, ideologies, conspiracy myths, and even symbols um, and language being picked up in the more mainstream political discourse and societal discourse discourse. And I think a lot of that had to do with, um, as I mentioned earlier, with the pandemic and with a lot of the grievances that spread then, but also the ways in which different target audiences could be um, could be approached based on different sets of grievances. So, for example, the COVID pandemic opened up a whole new space that was traditionally more on the left, actually, of people who were uh, skeptical about the vaccines, um, who were perhaps already opposed to the so-called elites, and who were open to em embracing conspiracy myths. And a lot of them have then gradually shifted through these uh, conspiracy myth channels, shifted more to the right. And the same is true for, for other audiences that could be targeted, for example, with fears about, um, for example, changing laws regarding the LGBTQ community, especially the transgender topic, which has been hugely controversial, has been an entry gate for, uh, for far-right ide far far right ideologues to, again, to approach a new or to target a new audience. Um, they would then slowly and gradually move towards their own um, worldviews and ideologies. And yeah, and to some extent, anti-feminism has also been on the rise. So it's it's really it's uh, different entry gates that have been used and exploited, and where the far right has really managed to um, also position themselves in opposition to the the other the centrist parties and to uh, frame themselves as the only alternative that is pushing back to the status quo. So I think this desire also for radical change and this um, well, this 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 frustration with the status quo that has also led many people to to vote for the far right because they were the only ones who would take a position um, outside of the mainstream, when it, whether that's about uh, the COVID, the dealing with the COVID pandemic and the vaccines, or about uh, Russia, or about climate change, mm -hmm. or about migration. Um, usually, they were seen as, in many of the cases, as the only players who would sit um, on a completely different side. So I think there is an elephant in the room in that discussion, namely uh, Russian influence. And on that note, I want to move our discussion to you, Anshul, and ask you, to what extent can we actually blame foreign or external actors for the rise of far right? Is this really direct interference, as we very often seem to, uh, to, to think? Or is it just plainly those countries realizing someone else's agenda without even being aware of this? I think it's a mix of both. I think there are two parts to this. One is, uh, uh, you know, the official legal cases you mentioned right at the top about uh, Mr. Kra. Um, and he's not only just made those comments, but, you know, there have also been serious allegations against AFD people for uh, taking money in exchange for pushing Russian propaganda here in uh, uh, the EU for various reasons. So there are serious allegations in the sense of legal cases and uh, um, things like that basically getting money from Russia. Uh, the other is a bit more, I would think, even a more insidious sort of campaign or tacit understanding or a psychological link between Putin, and I wouldn't say Russia here, I would specifically say Putin, and a lot of the leaders of the far right. Because Putin is kind of presenting himself as a paragon of masculinity, mm -hmm. and a lot of the leaders here uh, in Europe are predisposed to accept those ideas or are fan of such concepts or are opportunistic and are sort of clinging on to these ideas and are standing up against what is uh, being termed as woke culture, but actually amounts to personal liberties. 
whether it's sexual identity or, uh, you know, as asylum seekers and, and rights of all uh, people with all kinds of religions and, and, and beliefs. So I think there is a, there's a connection there between Putin and a lot of the leaders of these parties. And I find that more worrying because it works in ways that we can't very easily understand uh, and, 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 and impacts kind of people's minds when they go online and they read these comments. And I find that actually more worrying than uh, um, more legal allegations. But of course, there are specific cases such as Le Pen uh, has got loans from Russia. And she said she got loans from Russia for her Because campaign. she couldn't get loans in France, which I think is kind of a self-explanatory uh, case uh, right now. So uh, on that note, another thing that has been kind of floated around here in our discussion, uh, namely the response and the reaction from the Liberal Centre. And I want to ask you, Susanna, about that. What are the red lines that a democratic society, democratic institutions should not allow these parties to cross? And I think AFD is a particularly interesting uh, case uh, in that regard, because we have a provision in the German constitution that allows for banning outright parties that are classified as threat to democracy. And we know of AFD to be under surveillance of the German uh, intelligence services. There is a debate in Germany, delegalize them or not. Where do you stand? Uh, absolutely. AFD is the... Um is a very peculiar case for uh, multiple reasons, um, not only because it is uh, under the surveillance of the Federal Office for the Protection of the Constitution for uh, being uh, suspected uh, to be an extremist uh, organization that seeks to undermine the constitution of the country, but also because the party, as a party, is actually very much going counter the trends that we see in Europe. So whereas a lot of these parties, the far right parties, as they are gaining ground, they are trying to somewhat moderate at least their image and abandon the extremist ideas. Over the past years, especially, we see quite the opposite trend um, with AFD. So how should a democracy tackle that? So first of all, we are thinking in, uh, in within the European Union in the context of liberal democracies. So it's not only about elections, but also certain values, principles, which I mentioned before, tolerance, pluralism, protection of minority rights. So uh, it can be, uh, and when we are talking in the context of a militant democracy, that's the idea, that the democracy should have the right to protect itself from actors that would actively undermine the very principles that it's founded upon. And that is the idea that we see in the German constitution, um, that at the very extreme cases, the state, uh, the independent institutions of the state, uh, upon evidence, should have the right to ban a party. However, this is an extreme case, because uh, banning an organization that gathers uh, the support of a part of society uh, in a representative democracy is clashing with the idea of representativeness and freedom of speech. And so I'm going to interrupt you uh, for a second mm -hmm. and ask uh, a follow-up question. But wouldn't that uh, create uh, a reverse uh, reaction with the electorate, that by even trying to make them illegal, wouldn't we be just boosting their support and actually work to their advantage? Uh, yeah, and this is precisely uh, that very uh, thin line that uh, it's very hard to navigate. Uh, so um, such parties which are usually positioning themselves as challengers to the system uh, may just adopt the narrative that they are being victimized uh, by the very system that indeed could boost their support. Very difficult, very complex issue, a lot uh, to unpack. Thank you very much for your comments, Susanna Weg, Julia Ebner, Anhar Vora. Thank you very much. Everything seems to be pointing us to one conclusion this week. The far right is here to stay. But it's vital to remember that the support for these parties doesn't come from nowhere. The grievances of their voters are often legitimate. And as such, they pose a challenge to liberal and progressive politicians too. Not addressing them 
will lead to further political crisis, a scenario Europe cannot afford right now. Thank you for being with us tonight. Make sure to tune in next Thursday when we will be discussing the results of European Parliament elections. Good night and don't forget to vote.